So on the aisle with me, Charles Gross and Leslie Hogan Blake. Tonight reviews of The Unsinkable Molly Brown, Harry Townsend's Last Stand, Anatomy of a Suicide, 72 Miles to Go, and The Perplexed. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Two on the Aisle. And hello, everybody. And you may wonder, or you may not be, why we are doing well, you may have noticed we're using a different theme song tonight. Oh. Now, those of you who grew up in the city or near it and are of a certain age will recognize that tune as the opening theme from Wonderama. That was a children's show that played on Channel 5, back then known as WNEW, for many years. But in fact, the song originates from the musical The Unsinkable Molly Brown. And this was Meredith Wilson's uh, follow-up to The Music Man. It uh, played on Broadway with Tammy Grimes, was made into a successful movie with Debbie Reynolds, and has not been seen in these here parts since then. And there is a reason for it, probably, <laughs> because the original storybook was kind of lame, and I'm, I'm going by a dim memory of the movie which I saw years ago. Starring so, Debbie Reynolds. Starring Debbie Reynolds, yes, as we said. So Dick Scanlon has rewritten the book and rewritten some of this, added new lyrics to some of the songs. You still get the Wonderama theme, but you get what they say is an entirely new play, although certain things do remain. Um, a new book. A new, a new book. And new lyrics. And some new lyrics and some old ones, and basically a much, much better musical. Okay, so Molly Brown, probably best known for sailing on the Titanic and surviving. Now, ironically, in the uh, Debbie Reynolds movie, that's a very small part of the show. Here it plays a much more prominent part of the play. But before that, Molly is a young, ignorant, but spunky and very smart country gal looking to make her way to her dream city, which for some reason is Denver. She finds herself stuck in a mining town, meets the man she will marry, becomes very rich, gets educated, and spends the rest of the play trying to help people, often at the expense of her husband and her children. They the turn the silver mine that isn't producing into a gold mine, mm -hmm. which is producing. And that's right, they and they do quite well. And she's you know, running soup kitchens and helping her husband's workers form a union. Her husband's not overly crazy about that, at least not at first. And ultimately, they are separated. And he gets the children, which I find very interesting, given that this takes place in the late 18, early 1900s. There was no such thing as divorce back then, so the man always got the children and everything and else And she did. goes off to Europe, but when her husband is sick, she comes back on the Titanic, and the rest is literally history. Now, this was Meredith Wilson's follow-up to The Music Man. Mm -hmm. And as I would imagine we will see when the show, when The Music Man returns to Broadway this season, uh, Harold Hill is a very hard act to follow. Mm -hmm. Uh, even with the revisions, Molly Brown kind of pales in comparison. But it is, this revised version has charm, and it has spunk, and it's fun, and it's, well, gay in the definition that would have been used when the musical first opened. It's just a very classic, old-fashioned, and I mean that in a good way, evening at the theater, especially with Beth Malone in the title Unbelievable. role. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. I just mean, so wonderful. Yeah, she just dominates the whole Defines show. Defines the word spunk. <laughs> yes, yes. And she's exactly the type of lead that Molly Brown needs. She is just a beautiful and it just... A bundle of energy. Bundle Tiny of little energy. thing. She's about I'm, that tall. Actually. Well, you, yeah, you, but you won't realize that by looking at her on stage. She just seems to tower over everyone. Even uh, David Aaron uh, uh, Damon, who's a lot bigger than she is and plays her husband, does a good job. Um, in it, as does everybody else. There are, you know, assorted uh, characters. Well, I think what, what, what's happened here, because you mentioned that the fact that it was updated. Yes. Well, the updating comes from the diversity in the casting more than anything. The, there's, there are nips and tucks to what happens in the script, but right. it's the, the diversity, because here, J.J. Brown is a black actor. Right. Which, if uh, you're actually looking to do a more accurate <laughs> uh, portrayal of Molly Brown, you wouldn't have, but... Well, in in real life, no, but there were interracial marriages at the well, time. There were f few and far between, but there were very, such things. It was not, not but a great there time are also for that. the other rest of the cast is made up of Latinx people yes. and and you know uh, uh, and people of color, which would not have been in was certainly not in the movie. 
and and in all likelihood wasn't in a little town in right. the middle of Denver well, that's, either. That, seem, that seems to be a, a trend in but the But it doesn't these really days. bother us at this point, does it? I mean, we've, we've come so far in this whole thing. Well, I think the only time something like that is stirs a fuss if is if it's a white person playing a character well, who perhaps. Uh, I, I, I is not white. Perhaps. But um, I, I did a count. They, they actually put into the script a little breakdown of what was new and what wasn't new oh. and what was changed. Okay. So there are two, four, six, seven of the original songs as is. N uh, um, existing songs with new lyrics, one, two, three, four, five, including He's My Friend, which is a wonderful song. And then there, there are five brand new songs, which is a hell of a lot of songs, too, right. if you think Taken about it. Taken out of Meredith Wilson's trunk. Music by Meredith Wilson, right. but lyrics from, and not not from that show at all. Right. So, uh, he found a way to weave them in. Mm -hmm. The show is overstuffed. It's uh, the, the first act is a lot of exposition. The second act is suddenly there's there are lo longers, as they say, because there's space between. You kind of could do this in one in one act, I think, uh, and make it a little smoother. As long as he was rewriting the book anyway, <laughs> I think he could have done that. But yeah. again, uh, we're here to talk about this, the show that he did. So right. we put the two acts together, and it's it's a lovely evening. Uh, someone I know who doesn't like ninety percent of what he sees was crawling over this. He really, mm -hmm. he was just, yeah. what a wonderful play, what a wonderful. I'm so glad I came, kind of. Thing. Right. And you have to schlep down to the middle of the Lower East Side yes. in, in the grand houses on uh, the, in, the, in the Grand Street houses in, in the mm -hmm. uh, Abrams yes. Center, and yes, it's this worth is the it. uh, transport. Uh, the transport group, but this is their new home. A it's a, it's a a aptly named, considering that an important scene of this takes place on the Titanic. Yes, and it's the Abrams okay. Art Center, okay. and it's 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 the most the furthest mm. most point of a, of, a mm. s of a theater in New York and City. And I surprisingly find myself it, it's no Music Man, that's mm. for sure, <laughs> but I. I am going to give it four playbills because I just enjoyed it that much, especially Beth Malone. I would, I would probably say that's that's. I, I could even go to four point five because oh I, 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 in thinking about it, I would give it a four. But mm -hmm. the way I felt that night, it was mm -hmm. a four point five. Also, mm -hmm. with all the Michigas that's going on about the, the 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 election and and now the virus and whatnot, it was so nice to just escape. Right. This is staged and choreographed by Kathleen Marshall. Oh, I'm sure. I'm sure I should have yes. said that right away. Ooh. And Kathleen Marshall cannot do a bad show. Uh, which she's done some wonderful, wonderful shows that we have and, indeed and loved. And this is right up up there. Yes, yes. With, with and she them. really stage manages well. I mean, people come in and they go out and they move, and it's mm -hmm. a, there's a lot. Considering the stage is about yay big, yeah. she did a lot. For it, it it feels bigger. She made it work. Very little, se very little uh, uh, furniture, very little right. scenery, uh, lo but lots, lots of spunk lots and lots of, of action, fun. Yeah. All right, moving on. Well, moving on. It, here's a play called Harry Townsend's. Last Stand. And Harry Townsend Last Stand, if you could hold that for me if you would in between the two, thank you, um, is a, a, a two-character play, as you can see by the playbill, two-character play, uh, and the two characters are played, one by Len Carey and one by Craig Bierko. Who was in the last revival of Music Man yes, years ago. Yes, apropos. I, I have something to say about that. Okay. okay. So anyway, um, Len Carey has, in brief, it is a play about a, a man going a younger man going to visit his father and you uh, the first act is almost pure not neil si it's not it's, it's only one act the first no it is two acts it's two acts it is two acts the first act is is a lot of uh, back and forth it was almost neil simon-esque uh, although from a male perspective only i mean there was a lot of you know uh, uh len carrie loves to shock his son by 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 telling naughty jokes or and talking and, about and all the inappropriate places that he and the boy's mother had uh, relations yes okay uh, uh, thank you and uh, then the second act, we get to the core of what it's really about, which is why it could have been a one-act play. I think it's, it's stuffed with a lot of excess stuff that we don't need. Um, stuffed with stuff, that's a good one. Anyway, um, the second act, we find out that the, that the, the son, uh, played by, by, by Craig Bierko, Alan, has come to visit Harry, mm -hmm. his dad, to tell him that it's time to go to the nursing home. It's a, it's a conversation uh, that we are not unfamiliar with. The, my, my feeling on the play is the, the play's greatest asset is perhaps also its greatest weakness. Which this is, is a father and son. Uh, yes, they haven't seen each other for 18 months, but that's simply because geographically because the son lives in California mm -hmm. and it, it's a far schlep. So the unseen sister is, is taking care of the father. 
And there's no skeletons in the closet. They're not estranged. There's not this great reunion. They come and they talk. Dad, what are you eating? Well, you know that cereal's not good for you. One of the cleverest lines in the play, uh, father calls the son, you know what? You're a cereal killer. Because he, won't, he, won't, he doesn't I, want his I, father to have the sugary cereals. And that's the cereals. level of dad humor that, you know, is, yeah, that, is a and problem. That, and, and that's the problem. The thing is, it's a cordial relationship. It's a pretty common theme. And therefore, the play really... You may be right about too much stuff because we start losing interest in it. There, Look, there are no great revelations. There's the story, it's typical. It's real life. Real life isn't always that interesting. And well, well but I, and I do think it's in the zeitgeist right now. This particular issue and has been for the last maybe ten years with a lot because of the aging of America, as it were. Um, so well, it, it's it's not it's not the subject matter per se. I know. I it's know. the way they're handling I, it. That's what I was trying to say, but I didn't get to. So anyway, um, I did want to say to, uh, we'll we'll give it we'll we'll there's mm -hmm. really nothing more to say about it except oh. the two amazing performances uh, the two by amazing two performances. two great Broadway veterans, uh, I mean, Len uh, Cario, yes, my goodness, uh, Len Cario, who See, has never not worked. Len Cario was Tony nominated for applause after he won the Tony in uh, Barber uh, Demon Barber of Fleet Street. No, no, before, uh, no, no, just uh, Sweeney Todd was after applause. Oh, okay, sorry, I, I okay, um, anyway, okay. Uh, <laughs> but since you mentioned that, um, Craig Bierko, who also gave an amazing performance, two really top-notch no performances, uh, but Craig is leaving or has left the show, and he's being replaced by Angela Lansbury's uh, nephew, David Lansbury. Of course, Angela Lansbury was uh, his uh, Lens co-star in Sweeney Todd. And, and here's a little tidbit for you in case you didn't pick up on it. Okay. Um, oh, did you get it? Len played Michael Haggerty on Murder, She Wrote, starring... David's Angel aunt, uh, Angela. Angela Lansbury. Yes. So I thought you'd. Did you'd, I mention like they that. were in Sweeney Todd together? So there's this whole little incestuous thing going <laughs> on, is what we're trying to say. Um, but uh, I think also the fact that they're both musical comedy people has something to do with. They're not giving musical comedy performances. No. It might have made it more fun if they did. Oh, uh, it absolutely would have. Because and, and the interest. I'm sorry. That, no, I just said that we know that something right. serious is o coming. Also, yeah, well, it, you, you kind of, we don't know what we kind of hope, you yeah. know, because, you know, I mean, yes, the serial killer was a cute line, but you can only go so far with that. Interestingly, the father was a DJ in life. They don't really talk about that all that much. I, w I would have uh, been more interested in exploring that aspect of his life. They talk more about how he helped literally build this um, cottage bungalow colony that he's been living in for the last uh have to give decades. props to Lauren Helper, the uh, set designer. Mm -hmm. it, it's, it's a cottage. In, it, it, um, it's very much a cottage of people who have no taste <laughs> and, and, and who... Uh, you know, have everything sort of aqua blue and 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 right. and brick and mm -hmm. and all the f furniture is is terrible, horrible recliner right. era furniture, and it just really looks bad. And then w one thing that bothered me was when he leaves, he doesn't take anything. I mean, I I I've moved several times, as you know, and I'm packing up the bric-a-brac and I'm putting in the little things, and I want the photograph, and he leaves everything. Well, he still owns the he, house. He does take. Well, I won't spoil that. There's a lovely moment at the at. At that, but as far as we know, the play is supposed to continue through April. Yes, Something I think, like I th that. I think it has been. Ex it has been. Yeah, it was extended. Okay. Uh, George Eastman wrote it, and uh, Karen Carpenter directed it, yes. and this is at uh, the City Center stage too. Yes. So, so um, in conclusion. Oh, how many? How many? What? My, how um, many? One how to many five playbills, five lean. You really loved it. Three and a quarter. Um, I would go with three, okay. again, but. You know, these performances, are I would performances, give 4.5. I would go, yeah. Performances, yes. Just, yeah. Definitely worth seeing to yeah. see these two amazing actors. Well, yeah, you're not going to see them. Right. Well, you'll see, <laughs> all right, you'll see, Len, you'll see Len Cario, and hopefully uh, David Lansbury will be, will yes. you know, also yes. be excellent. And, and by the show. way, his show was just canceled. He was 10 years on the Blue Bloods, right. which I never watch, mm -hmm. but he played the father of... Of uh, the father, yes. Ma of the... the, the, the ma ma the guy with the mustache. Yes, I, I know who you're talking what about. What the hell is his name? I don't know. We'll come. <laughs> okay. He was he on Broadway. He was on Broadway in a thousand clowns, that and he was the was? original Magnum. Magnum. That's well. That's yes. He was Magnum's father. Was okay. what I wanted to say. Yes, okay, he was I mean, Magnum's father. We'll put the, we'll, we'll we'll super his name in. We will. And you are moving on to. 
Anatomy of a Suicide. Indeed. Okay, well, that's a... Happy, happy, we're going from not too happy know, to, to hilarious, well, right? We, well, not, yeah. Uh, <laughs> well, we saw a um, play called Little Gems, and this was a three-person play involving three generations of daughters. Now, Anatomy of a Suicide is not a three-person play. This is uh, a regular play with, with a substantial cast, mm -hmm. but it does deal uh, with three generations of women, uh, grandmother, mother, daughter, and granddaughter, and um, two and of them... And the subject the, of the, suicide. The subject yes. of suicide, which ultimately the two, uh, two of the generations commit, and the third woman who becomes a doctor is concerned about... Right, and the committing. idea is, is it a genetic predisposition right. or not? Well, that's, that's an interesting thing that I wish the play uh, would have gone more into. This was written by Alice Birch and directed by Liliana Blaine Cruz, who, who had her work cut out for her because often these three generations are on stage at the same time. But via the playwright and the director, you kind of know which one to pay attention to. I didn't. I have okay. to tell you, I was getting dizzy like an old three-ring circus. I was sitting on Not the side, to which do. didn't help. Yeah. If I'd been sitting center, I might have had a better chance. But I was slightly to the side, and I was, I was going like, and, and from the side, you can't quite tell where, right. where to look next. And I really had trouble with mm. that. And we didn't have that trouble in Little Gems. I mean, no, no. Well, partially because Little Gems, it would have one, generally, would have one generation, right. the other. It, it wasn't simultaneous. This is simultaneous. Overlapping so, dialogue. Yeah, from it, it overlaps. Is, and that can and be scenes, very and time confusing. Zones. But yeah. just getting back to, to the plot, yes, I do wish we could have delved in deeper what, what is with these women. I mean, it, it, obviously, it, it's hereditary, oh. given that three generations have it. Uh, but, you know, what's causing it? What happened? Why? And I thought we got a very clear picture from the original mother, the grandmother. Uh, a, 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 an absolutely chilling performance by Carla Gugino. Yes. Um, and I would have had a terrible time as an actor myself, mm -hmm. having to sit and stare into nothingness and keep saying, the baby, the baby. Baby, right. baby. Well, the baby, really. that would be Celeste uh, Arias, yeah. who, is, who is the daughter yeah. who we hope will beat this, uh, but does not. And then there is Carol, the um, daughter slash granddaughter, uh, very nicely played. A doctor. A, do a doctor, yes. I'm sorry, not Carol. Um, that's uh, Bonnie is, is the granddaughter, and that's uh, Gabby Beans. Right. Who... Uh, who has uh, this fisherwoman beautifully played. This is the standout of the play. This fisherwoman by uh, Joe May, uh, who plays multiple roles but stands out yeah, she's as, great as, the good, as the granddaughter's lover, uh, an occasional lover in, in other roles. And she's just, I love this fisherwoman character. She's, a, she's she, hilarious she comes in to with look a, at, I guess to it's hear. A, yes, to hear. She comes in with this big fish. I think it's a bass that she's ready to fillet and cook. And the, it, it gives the play a very... M a much needed co comic Absolutely. lift. Cause, I you mean, know. you don't really go to a, a play called Anatomy of a Suicide thinking I'm going to have a good time tonight. Well, I, I, I mean, no, but seriously, there are times when I when I have to drag my feet to go into something because of the title, mm -hmm. regardless of what I know about it, and I didn't know right. much about it. I would like to say something about Richard Topol, who played mm -hmm. the husband and of and the other grandmother of, of the grandmother of and Levy. other leading right. male characters in it mm -hmm. who ha gave such a wonderful uh, performance in indecent as the stage mm -hmm. manager who to who told the story right um, and so you know he's a, he's a, a veteran character actor and it was nice to see him in, a, in yeah. this kind of show uh, all in all i found this very sharply done uh, yes hard to follow at times yes i might have wanted to uh, delve into the um, you know, what's causing this a bit more, mm -hmm. but three, actually four very solid performances and uh, a play that kept me on my toes uh, throughout. So I will give this uh, three and three quarters. Okay, I would give each one a separate, you know, these okay. were like three separate plays and I didn't feel that they That's blended the way that I would have liked them to. No, they did not. And as a result, it was like watching three simultaneous one acts, it's even though essentially with, with, that's a, with what a similar it's theme. Well, you know? similar theme and a relation in that all three, all three generations of women uh, lived in the same house. I just matter of fact, the house, there, there's this house that uh, the grandmother, Carol, buys right. with her husband, and her daughter inherits it, and subsequently her granddaughter inherits it. Right. And the house, which is where I think two of the suicides took place, yeah, as, as a, as becomes, vibes, becomes yeah. a character in the play. But I will say something, that, and I think this, this is interesting. It just got me. You know, sometimes in film, the editor 
will, will cut things in yes. a strange way. I wonder if this director maybe took three one-act plays that this woman wrote on the same subject and decided to put them on the stage at the same time. And that's an interesting concept. I have to think about that more. That's I, possible. <laughs> just, just a thought. Um, but neither of them by themselves would have been made a complete play. That's so so giving, having said that, I mm -hmm. would get, you, did you say three? I, I said three and three quarters. I would give it three and consider that generous. Okay. With, a, with very, very high props to Carla Bugino. Right. Very high props. Very difficult character to play. Yes. Speaking of difficult characters to play, um, this is 72 Miles to Go, yes. which is a, I'm going to put that down and hold this up. It's easier. Ah, I'm trying. Okay, 72 miles to go. Um, it's, it's, it's ripped from the front pages of the, of the uh, papers. It's 72 miles to the border in a little uh, border town. And um, mother, the mother is a, an, an undocumented immigrant married to an American citizen whose children are DACA for some reason. No, no. Her what happened? Oh, she wh brought a boy with her. She brought a boy okay, with her it. when she illegally crossed. So, yeah, she, so she who was adopted by her husband. Right. I got it. I did remember that. Right. That's in the play. They, they have two, they that. have two children of their own right. who are citizens because their okay. father was an so American citizen. The, the play is by Val, by Hillary Batiste, Bet, I think is the way she pronounces her name, who is a, set, a somewhat generational. Uh, she had a, a Mexican uh, grandfather. It said in one of the notes. Um, the uh, young. The father of the, of the uh, company is uh, Trini Sandoval, who just ran over from Thin Place to do this. He was just in Thin Place, right. and then now he's in this show. Right. He plays the, he plays the father, the who father. is this uh, preacher who would like to be a comedian or, or attempts to uh, be funny and tends to fall flat every Not time. Not unlike several of the preachers who are on Sunday mornings. <laughs> if you okay, don't watch them, you don't know. And uh, Bobby Moreno plays Christian, the older son, right. who is constantly because he is trying to get DACA status and doesn't have it, he's not able to get a decent job, even right. though he's he's lived here since he was eight mm. years old. And, and it, does, it does not help that he was um, arrested for drunk driving. It doesn't help, but you know, that's it's drunk driving. It's not... But, but here's the kicker. Yes. And this is going to make Leslie feel very bad. This play takes place between 2008 oh, yeah. and 2016. Therefore. And therefore, well, what it teaches us it is that this is a Obama problem yeah, okay. in the Obama era. It teaches us that this is a problem that preceded the current administration and will most likely uh, linger on regardless of who's in office, un unfortunately. Okay. Getting back to the play, though. So the mother, whose name is Anita, right. has been arrested and deported. Right. So she's back in Nogales. I believe it's Nogales. It, it, this takes place she's, in Tucson. It, she's in Mexico. It's it's literally seventy two miles away. Yeah. I they think want. She doesn't want them to come and see her, except that they do at the end of the play. So it, it's a little confusing. And they 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 grow up. Uh, mm -hmm. Actually, what I think well, one of the best performances that we saw was Tyler Alvarez as Aaron, the youngest son, mm -hmm. who goes from being really just a kid, high school freshman, kid. Going to become uh, a marine, an army, uh, yeah, no, and a, and milita a military veteran, and 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 he he's, it, I mean, it's a space of maybe four or five years in his eight. life. Okay, it's eight years in his life, but he actually ages into that so well yes. on stage, better it, than it's a, here, Here's the problem with the play. All right, imagine your mother is being has been deported. Your father is trying to bring her back. Any, by any means possible. So he tries to smuggle her back in a refrigerator. Imagine that. You have to, because it's only described and we don't see it. Well, what, what do I we wouldn't see in, want to see what, it. What do we see in this play? Kids go to high school. Kids graduate from high school. One gets married. One joins the military. It's a day-to-day -day thing. You will pity this uh, family, but you won't be very interested in them. And so the playwright, instead of the drama, which is there it's always it's always in the background but it's in the background the focus of the play is the day-to-day -day living of the family and as with Harry Townsend it's not all that interesting well I think it was a very brave way to go I mean it, I think because of the subject matter it would have been very easy to make this into a, 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 a melodrama right. which it's not and interesting I think the playwright started writing this five years ago or more even, so yeah. you know having no idea how timely the issue would be interesting the young man playing the the older son mm -hmm. is the husband of Hillary of Batiste yes of, of the playwright and uh, the uh, Bobby set, Marino Marino Bobby Marino 
and the stage set uh, was by t Tony Winner uh, for Hades Town, Rachel Hauk. Uh, there's not that much of a stage yeah, set. Yeah, and, and it, it can be confusing because some of it takes place in Billy, the father's right. house. Some of it takes place in Christian, the son's house. But it's but all it's the, the same exact yes. same set, yes. same, same yes. so it, you're, where am I? Well, it takes you there. I mean, you sort right. of know when you get there. Anyway, the point is, oh, by the way, directed by Joe Bonney, who is a, right. a, a fabulous director. Mm, I think she moved this as, as best she could. Oh, I, well. I, I know. Well, you know, you do. You work with right. what you got. Uh, and yeah. so, in conclusion. Well, in conclusion, how many would I give it? Yes. I give it an A for effort, but that's it's that's not what counts at this point. It is off Broadway at the at the at the Laura Pell. Um, I yes. I know. Mm, I would give it three point three and a quarter. I would give it two and a half. Okay. Yeah. I, kn I know why. I understand. I yeah. understand. Finally, I went to see The Perplexed at the Manhattan Theater Club. And there is this set by Santo... Uh, La Quasto. La Quasto. It's beautiful. It's this huge library that's supposed to be part of this big Fifth Avenue apartment house. It's gorgeous. It has a fireplace. It has a terrace. It has all these rooms. It's got beautifully tastefully done, and I, I want to move there. I want to live on, on that set. And you know what I think? I think Richard Greenberg, who wrote Take Me Out, which will be revived later this year, he took a look at a set or a model of it and said, oh, I got to write a play for that. He didn't have an idea for a play, but he wrote one anyway. And the result is uh. The Perplexed, which describes anyone who goes to see it. I thought you were going to do a little, um, you know, Laurel and Hardy that with that, uh, that yeah. head thing and yeah. go, I'm perplexed. Yes, yes. <laughs> Yes, that's yeah, there. We go. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's, um, that's that's doing both of them. Yes. <laughs> so he, here's the story, such as it is: uh, two young people who actually knew each other growing up, getting married because they reacquainted themselves meeting on the subway. Um, grandfather of the bride is a mean sob. We never see him, but he's like right next door to the library. We never actually leave the library. Um, and nobody really likes him, which is probably why the Groom's Especially family, who was really screwed over by the guy, is still very amiable with the bride's family. And again, it's kind of like Harry Townsend or 72 Miles. Characters talk. Uh, no, I disagree. And talk. I disagree. This is written as a comedy. And there is really? there are lines. Yeah, I'm sorry. It, it, it's very it's intellectual. I was comedy. supposed to be laughing. It's intellectual comedy, but uh, because we got the script and I read the script, I did and too. And these are back and forth lines of very very uh, intelligent people making puns and jokes. In our family, we have a tradition of hanging in there. <laughs> I know. There's never been a divorce in our family. I know. There should have been hundreds. <laughs> yes. With each other. That's not the same as, as any of these other plays. All whether right. they land or not, whether whether you get them or not, nope. is a different story. But they, they're they, there. They don't. They don't land. Well, m they they're, did for me. The, the story, to me, the story just bombs out. I mean, okay, it may be fun to see Eric William Morris playing a Southern rabbi, complete with accent. We we saw him in uh, Subways or Sleeping Last We have, we have a soft spot in our heart for Eric. We do. <laughs> And, all right, um, Margaret Colin as a councilwoman who, before coming to her son's wedding, stops in her district because there's been a water main explosion and, consequently, her dress is wet. All right, cute idea, interesting setup. Think of her as Judith Light. <laughs> Light. Oh, wait, you didn't let me finish. Judith Light. Light. Yeah. Well, okay. think, think of this as play light <laughs> because, or could use some light. Or please illuminate me. Okay, it's got a lot of. Uh, you were mentioning. You mentioned Margaret. It has uh, uh, several uh, uh, veteran off Broadway and Broadway actors, all of whom are, are, have been in or know uh, Richard, and that includes Patrick Breen, Greg Edelman, Alana Levine, and Frank Wood. That's not the entire cast, but all of those character, uh, those actors are well known character actors. You know them from television. Several of them. Um, Frank Wood especially is doing a bunch of things right now. Right. But uh, anyway, that's just a side issue. I would like to live in that apartment. Um, we all would like to live in that apartment. By the way, Lynn Meadow, head of M Manhattan Theatre Club, directed this. She right. has directed several of Richard Greenberg's plays. Take Me Out was directed by Joan Mantello. And um, hmm, what are the, do, do we want to say anything more about it? Yes, two playbills. Okay. 
Uh, okay. Um, sure. Uh, Two playbills, and I'm calling my broker about the apartment. I have a uh, little fat chance you have of getting it. I have two <laughs> yeah, things. Well, I, just have two, I just have two quick things to say. Okay. Um, 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 one of them is that Richard Greenberg was my dad's neighbor when my father was elderly and living alone uh, in Chelsea. And he was very nice to my father. And, they would th and my father would say to him, I, I write too. <laughs> then he would show him things that he had written. And Richard was kind enough to say, I like that a lot, yes, I really did. <laughs> and I don't know whether he really meant it or not, but he was a really sweet man. Okay. Um, the perplexed, we are a bit perplexed. I overall enjoyed the apartment, the clothing, um, yes, she like She went that. home humming the set. I, and the costume, yes. But you will give it? Oh, 2.5. OK. What did you give it? I gave it two. two. Yeah. Okay. My father didn't know the playwright. <laughs> <laughs> and so that is our show point. for the evening. When you go to the theater, look for Leslie and me, us too. On the aisle. Uh, with our hand wipes and our sanitizer, we'll be there. <laughs>